or back to danger. I remember seeing parents laying on top of their children in fear and trying to protect them the best they could from what was happening. I remember sitting at every stoplight while, my dr while driving my children to the hospital, trembling to the point the car was shaking. In complete fear, every car pulling up beside me was the person who hit my children. Yes, Mr. Brooks, I remember. I watched my son not be able to sit alone in a room for weeks. I watched my children not be able to sit still without being anxious and fidgeting for months. I watched my children wake up with nightmares to this day. I saw gut-wrenching guilt on my husband's face for feeling like he didn't protect his family. And to this day, I feel anger and hatred more than I realized I could ever could for a person I have never even met. But aside from all of that, I am thankful. Thankful that by some miracle, my family and I walked away that evening. Although I could not attend most of the trial in person, I did view either via Zoom or on TV. I viewed everything from the pre-trial, jury selection, and trial itself, and I am disgusted that a grown man could act the way Mr. Brooks acted during all of this. Mr. Brooks claims he was raised a Christian and his mother raised him better than he was acting at the beginning of the trial, but Mr. Brooks continued to be rude, selfish, and disrespectful from sleeping during court endless interruptions and outbursts, rude comments, facial expressions, and lack of remorse for his actions and how he was treating everyone in court, from the prosecutors, victims, witnesses, and judge herself. I never thought Mr. Brooks could make myself or my family feel victimized all over again, but he did. I keep remembering how Mr. Brooks was upset the detective in the investigation asked to speak to one of his children. I asked myself, it's not okay to speak to his child, but it's okay to intentionally hit two of my children and drive away. That's okay. Why my children? Why any children? How could someone do this? How could someone have no compassion for the victims, the families? We deserve answers. Our children deserve answers, true and honest answers. Never once did I see true remorse for anyone but himself or his family during the trial. Mr. Brooks also stated something along the lines of anyone who knows him or spends enough time with him knows he would never do something like that. But Mr. Brooks, you absolutely did. Mr. Brooks hit my children and so many more people and never once stopped. Not only did he kill, injure, and traumatize so many that night, he decided to victimize everyone again by forcing them to not only testify as to what happened because he felt compelled to plead not guilty, but he also forced these victims and family members, including my husband, to face the monster that did this and answer the questions he felt the need to ask. How can someone face each person on the stand knowing what was done that night, question them as if they were the ones on trial when all of the victims and witnesses were doing that night were creating memories? Unfortunately, memories were created, but not the memories I planned to have with my children. Instead, the fear I have seeing a maroon SUV driving towards myself or my family is now paralyzing. Seeing a vehicle drive too fast down any street makes me physically sick to my stomach. My children panic at the sight of an emergency vehicle. Seeing people run and yell unexpectedly, even if just for fun, makes my heart drop, and my mind brings me back to the night of the parade, hearing the screams, yells for help, and cries from that night will haunt me until the day I die. Those are the memories I have from the night. The only good that has come from this is Mr. Brooks will never be able to hurt another person outside of prison ever again. The guilty verdict and hopefully life plus sentence will protect anyone that may have been hurt by Mr. Brooks in the future, and that I can be thankful for. Please, on behalf of myself and my family, we ask Mr. Brooks to be sentenced to the fullest extent. Mother of victim KKK and LLL. Next to speak will be victim S. <laughs> Um, I'm taking some notes and I was wondering, um, uh, it was a little confliction there is, uh, victim KKK eight or nine. I can't answer that, sir, but that was a written statement read from the mother of victim KKK. I apologize. Man. I was just taking notes. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. My name is Kelly Grebo, and I was walking in the Christmas parade with my daughter, Adelia, on the 21st. I'm not one for public speaking, obviously. I'm very nervous. 
but I was given a chance to be the voice for my daughter and, and I. That is what fueled me to stand here today. Now I can only <clears throat> tell you our story, but I believe the tragic events of that day have affected many of us in a similar manner. I can honestly say I have never felt the hatred I do for one person like I do this man. The very man that drove his vehicle into my nine-year-old baby girl who was excitedly walking in the Christmas parade. She was so excited to dress up that day as Cindy Lou Who. We spent weeks figuring out costume, her costume and picking her hairstyle. She was excited to have her hair and makeup done and to help spread holiday cheer, to see her friends and her family that were there to be spectators at the parade that became witnesses to this horrible act themselves. So many lives were changed that day. Although many of us, for the most part, have healed physically, emotionally, many of us have been scarred. I have questioned whether those emotional scars will ever truly go away, remembering the roller coaster of emotions that day. And after being struck myself lying on the ground and seeing the tires pass directly in front of my face and just waiting for the pain to begin, being filled with absolute fear of not knowing where my daughter Adelia was or if she was okay, then running only to find her the way I did, the way so many of us found our loved ones that day, lying helpless on the cold, hard ground. My knees buckled the minute I got to her. Seeing my child, sorry. Seeing my child that this so-called sorry excuse for a man ran a 3,000 pound SUV into her tiny little body. There are so many times when I close my eyes, I still see my baby girl laying in the street helpless, not moving, just staring in complete shock, not even recognizing her own grandparents when they came to her side. Seeing that look in her eyes will forever be embedded in my mind. As a parent, we are supposed to be able to protect our children. And that day, many of us were reminded of the ugly in this world. That no matter what we do, there will always be monsters like Darrell Brooks that are lurking around corners, just waiting for a chance to play those parts in our nightmares. Yet even after causing this much pain and destruction, he wasn't even happy with that. He didn't stop there. He took it upon himself to be his own representation, knowing full well he would be given the chance to question us as victims and rip open the wounds once again and show no remorse. I can tell you, sitting on the stand that day, reliving the horrific events, having him look in my direction, brought up so many memories and emotions of that night. Hearing his voice made me cringe with disgust and anger. He changed our Adelia that day. He stole her innocent, happy look on life and replaced it with fear and hate that no child at the now age of 10 should ever feel. Although those feelings are warranted, she was forced that day to see the ugly in this world also. And her joyous outlook on the holiday season was stolen. I'm not sure if she will ever again attend another parade, let alone a Christmas parade. I don't know when the unexplained loud noises will ever not, make, not take me back to that day and make me jump, make my heart rate increase. However, I do know every day is a new chance we have to take back our lives and give this man no more than he has already taken. We are now stronger than we ever imagined. We would have to be as a family and as a community and that we that he cannot have. He does not deserve that. What Darrell Brooks does however deserve is to be, does deserve is to be sentenced to the maximum time allotted for each one of his horrific convictions as he has given us as a community, a life sentence of these memories. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Literally the minute we walk away. Yeah, I mean, we thought it was going to start at one. I told you, don't believe the chat. <laughs> Thanks, June. I got it. That's why I started frantically trying to set up a stream because I didn't know if Mike would be back or not. Thank you. Yeah, I just saw it on. I just turned it on and even looked. That, that's, yeah, John and I just had signals crossed. We thought it was restarting at one. 
all good. The delay with some like safety. Called, I do like that she called him a monster. For some reason, that bothers him. It, it's so fitting, but it, that that bothers him. So, yeah, I suggest they all do it. Oh yeah, I want every single person to question his manhood. It sure does. Did they bomb the microphones? I mean, I was just coming back on. Did you get an explanation as to what did did she the judge say anything as to the break or anything? Uh, she did make a statement. I missed it. I was going to rewind it and just catch up during the break, but I'll go back and take a look at some point. We didn't have a power cord, but uh, no, that one. Might. Actually, let me do that right now. Run and grab the power cord, and then it, it should work. We have. Okay. There's a change between what we were using earlier, and that's why probably it's not. Recognizing the computer. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay. Simply wait for the technology, but we will do that if you want to wait. We'd like to wait if that's all right. No problem. Yeah, I can barely hear hear her for what it's worth. Yes. You may need Miss Gussie back for that. Okay, so she just said that there was a threat called in, the sheriff secured the building, beefed up security. And she's like, I'm not gonna stop the entire time Brooks is giving her like a sure it's safe. Some days are complete blur. Or turn the microphone closer to you. Oh, sorry. Katie Publiner, mother of Tyler Publiner. Looking back over the last 358 days, some days are a complete blur, others are vivid as yesterday. At 4.39 p.m. on 11-21-21, changed my life, my sons, my family, my friends, and the Waukesha community. During the closing arguments, the defendant spoke of family. His grandmother released her statement to the media speaking of family. Through the past 360, 300, 358 days, we have heard from the Brooks family that the defendant has a mental illness as a reason for his decisions that evening, except the decision making goes back further than that. It seems the decision was made not to get help, not to stay medicated, et cetera, and said to use it as an excuse for poor selfish decisions. My family almost lost the only son, the only grandson, the only nephew, and that was not our decision. As a parent, I have carried the guilt that I debated with my son that he had to go to the parade that day. It was mandatory for his grade. The Packers were playing. It was cold and windy. I had to use a life teaching moment. He made a commitment to the band. This was all part of it. 
He reluctantly he left reluctantly. I talked to him shortly after I found a parking spot downtown to make sure he was warm enough and told him the general area where I was going to look for a spot to watch the band perform. From 4.33 to 4.34 p.m., I watched the South Band march and perform in front of me. As I was packing up my blankets and chair into the wagon, I noticed what I thought was between a 2008 to 2012 maroon red Ford Escape driving extremely fast past me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I remember making the mental notes about the vehicle, the driver, turned to a friend sitting with me, and we were both in awe. Then we heard the screams and the sounds of things being hit, like when you bump into a construction barrel on the freeway. From 446 to 458 was complete chaos. Fighting the crowd of people running out of the area, screaming shots fired, trying to find my son. As I approached the intersection of Main Street and Barstow, the area went completely dark, maybe only in my mind. As I searched for my son, asking people if they knew where he was. A familiar voice behind me said, he's over here. I turned to see him laying in the street with his feet pointing north. First, enter your pin to unlock the device. Apologies. We had no idea what had happened, only that he was tasting blood and that his stomach hurt. Soon EMTs were there and we went for a run up and down Main Street as as he was being helped before they had a true plan where they were going to stage the injured. He was taken off the gurney and placed in the street to wait an ambulance. This is where we met our first hero of the journey. A complete stranger came to sit with us and help roll my son while he was vomiting blood from his injuries, help to keep him calm and confront and comfort his fears. That was the 18 minutes that felt like an hour. I remember looking around as I waited, not too far in front of me was a very young officer with his rifle standing guard. To my left were two brothers that we had known from the band and baseball. One lying on the street, clearly injured, the other standing by. I felt completely helpless as I wanted to, to go and help them. But I couldn't leave my son injured. They say everything happens for a reason, something I have firmly believed. At 5.16 p.m., we were loaded into the ambulance, as I refer to it as a little ambulance that could. While in the middle of everything, it had a coolant leak. The smell of antifreeze will trigger me forever. We made it out to Oconum Walk, and I learned after that it made another run after that before it died. While my son was whisked away to emergency surgery, I had to start making phone calls, returning text messages, figuring out what was next. While he made it through surgery, will he make it through surgery? How bad were his injuries? After six days at the hospital, we were sent home. My athletic son. Couldn't lift, over, lift our cats, pour a glass of milk, put his socks and shoes on. He has a scar almost two foot long. And as a catcher, he questioned his ability to be able to play the sport he loves, the sport that he eats, breathes, and sleeps. After missing school and work for almost two months, we were able to start to get back. and work up to a full-time basis over the course of a month. <clears throat> One ling lingering injury brought questions if he could play ball for what would be the first full season of his high school career. COVID had canceled and shortened the prior two. April 6th, he took to the field with that bandmate that was lying in the street just a few feet from us just three months earlier. As we tried to find the sense of normal in between doctor's appointments and procedures, 
Next one. Through the process and the journey of the Jesus system, we have found a new family, one that can relate to the horror, the fear, the trauma of that night, changing our lives forever. The criminal complaint had listed 62 named victims, now survivors, six to gain their wings. What it did not include were the 16 jurors that had also become victims of the defendant's actions that night, while the named victims, their families and friends had to relive that night they were experienced firsthand. Mrs. Edwards statement asked that we forgive her grandson blaming the mental illness, not encouraging him to take ownership for his actions. She said that she lost a grandson, his mother lost a son, his children lost a father. That isn't completely a true statement as they will be able to talk to him, send him letters, visit him, hopefully in a maximum security prison. They seem to forget there is a mother that can't kiss her son goodnight, a father that can't play ball with his son, a brother that can't fight with his brother and still be his best friend. There are three children that can't call their mother for advice, go shopping, plan their weddings, or have them watch over them as they reach for their dreams. There are numerous grandchildren that won't get to go to grandma's anymore, get spoiled and sent home, hyped on sugar and love. There are teenagers that had to grow up way too quickly, having to make adult decisions about their future. There are girls that may never dance again without fear. Their innocence taken away by a selfish decision. There is a grandfather that cannot tell the family stories anymore. He can't watch his wife dance. These families will forever be missing their loved ones. They can't call them, write a letter, or visit them. Nothing will bring back the son, the mom, the daughter, the grandma, and the grandfather to these families. Nothing can restore the innocence lost to these, to ease their fear. But this community came together to lift up each other up, support each other, looked after those that were in their worst moments, celebrated the wins along the way, returning to the dance floor, dancing in the streets, and playing baseball. The prosecution team did an amazing job representing everyone of the, of the plaintiffs in this case. Thank you. The victim witness team was so caring and diligent in keeping us informed. Being whenever there was a question that came up. Pepper, who greeted us every time we came to the courthouse, she put a smile on everyone's face, brought a little humor or a caring snuggle. You can do the last one, Tom. Your Honor, you are the standard that should be set across the country. Your patience, your diligence will never be forgotten. From the selfish actions of one person came to a community, came from a, excuse me, from one selfish actions of one person came a community rising like a phoenix, stronger than ever, stronger together. I ask that you hand on the maximum possible sentence without parole in prison so that everyone in our Waukesha strong community can heal, remember, grow, and never have to look back. Is that the PowerPoint? Just, yeah, if you just finish it down. I'm Tyler Pudliner, uh, victim O. Your Honor, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and share my impact statement with the court. It has been a long time coming, but I cannot thank the courts enough for giving not only myself, but all of us who have been affected the opportunity to share our stories. First, I would like to start off with you, Judge Doro. Thank you, Your Honor. We have all been going through these proceedings for almost a year now, and it is almost hard to believe that this is the first time that we've gotten the opportunity to communicate with you directly. I understand now that this is how the process takes place. Now, since the beginning of these proceedings, 
I've obviously gone through a lot of emotions as having been a victim and survivor in this case. I hate to say it like this, but it seems that, that for a greater portion of the year, and especially throughout the most recent proceedings, and my mother can confirm this, I've been somewhat angry towards you, Judge Doro. And I would now like to apologize for that. Maybe it's because I either did not understand or did not want to become aware of how lengthy the process was. There have been multiple occasions where I have gotten very mad or annoyed due to your rulings that either didn't go the prosecution's way or that I personally felt shouldn't have been made. Obviously, there are also multiple occasions where these disruptions that would continuously be, continuously be made by the defendant would take up way too much time and cause way too many delays throughout the trial portion of these proceedings. It would stress all of us out more than we should have ever been, to say the least. I would keep asking my mother, other families involved, the prosecution, and with victim witness teams, why can't Judge Duro do more to stop the disruptions? Why did she let that one testimony go on for way longer than it should have? But in all thanks to those amazing people sitting behind me, I was able to get the clarification and understanding that I need to calm down and help me understand that we were making steps forward in the process. And I wanted, and that we were going to finally arrive at the finish line as winners. That's why I wanted to start off by thanking you first today, Judge Doro. I am very glad that we have finally arrived at this point in the process where I can say that you did an amazing job throughout the entire process. You have not only shown myself or just the court, but an entire nation and world, um, for, the, for that matter, that you conducted these proceedings with the utmost respect and decorum to all of the parties involved. Lastly, Your Honor, I want to acknowledge your sainthood. Your devotion to this trial can never be matched. Your fair rulings, passion for this case, and kindness to everyone is more than everyone could have asked for, and for that, I again thank you. You've truly become like a mother and a true hero to this community, and that, we, and for that, we appreciate you, Judge Doro. I would also like to thank this amazing prosecution team, Sue, Leslie, Zach, Tom, Christy, and Ryan. You guys have been the glue that has held us together throughout this entire process over the past year. You've all taken extra time out of your day to stay late and either be able to answer all of our questions or just talk and reassure us that even though with all those sleepless nights and countless hours of delay, we would be okay. I can confidently say that I don't think there could have been a better team put together to represent us as the plaintiffs in this matter. Just like Judge Doro, all of you have shown the passion, blood, sweat, and tears, and extraordinary effort that has been poured into this case to give us the justice that many have desired and deserve. Consider yourselves true heroes to this community as well. I would also like to highlight Jen and her extraordinary team at Victim Witness Assistance. Again, a group of truly amazing people that I can't say enough words about to describe their amazing work. If we needed a shoulder to cry on, they were there. If we needed to make that late night phone call to get the answers we desired, they answered. We can truly not thank you guys enough for all your hard work and unmeasurable amount of effort that you gave us during this case to our families. And you cannot forget about personally my favorite employee in the entire courthouse, Pepper. You know how they say a dog is a man's best friend. Well, Pepper is an entire community's best friend. I personally, and I'm sure that I could speak for all of us when I say this, could not be more thankful for all the donations that have been made or have made Pepper possible. Jen and her staff have done an amazing job keeping her in line while she did what any dog does best. It gives us so much unconditional love that for a split second, you feel like all the problems are gone. Once again, I cannot thank everyone who represented us as the state of Wisconsin. You guys did one hell of a job throughout this process and have truly become a special part of this group. Um, finally, I want to take the time to describe how the events that occurred on November 21st, 2021 have affected my family and myself. No one thinks... Um, that something like those horrendous acts committed by the defendant on 11 2021 will ever happen to you. Christy, if you could please. I want you to look at that, Mr. Brooks. That's what you did to me that night. That's us in the ER waiting. I remember bits and pieces, but that is what happened. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Christy. Throughout the past year, I have become very close to other families involved in this matter. All the pictures there have what kept me going. The sport of baseball and all the other families affected in that community. I've gained more little brothers than I can say and an entire new baseball team to live out the, the rest of this life with. Next slide, please. I've also met so many new friends post 11, 2021. A new grandmother to add to such a wonderful family a new, another new brother in that instance that have just helped me get through everything. And it's kept us stronger through the whole process. Next slide, please, Christy. I've also gotten to become closer to other groups that were affected. 
last Saturday, I marched with the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies in their Christmas parade. But, uh, Veterans Day parade. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, coming together with other groups like this is something that has, again, shown that we are very strong. We are stronger than the defendant, and we are an entire community that has shown that strength. These memories are what have kept us going and will forever keep us going in this process. Next slide, please, Christy. As I stated before, um, baseball is a sport that has specifically kept me going. Wrestling is another love. I've gotten to meet some very cool wrestlers, uh, Braun Strowman, to name a few, or, and Ric Flair. Um, a race car driver, a local race car driver that I pit for at Slinger Speedway has basically been another grandfather throughout this entire process. He spent every day with us at the hospital for the week I was hospitalized, except Thanksgiving. Um, I've gained another brother who's pictured there at that wrestling event with another part of my truly amazing and big family that I've gained out of this. Christian Yelich, a brewer, and my favorite player and now manager of the Brewers Trade Council. You go to the next slide, please. Finally, this right here, this is me and my buddy, Eric. We were both affected that day, and we made the return within three months of everything happening to come back and play the sport that we love. We did not stay down. We did not cry. You know, didn't let it get to us. We came back stronger than ever. Yeah, we might have lost, but we played hard and truly showed this entire community that we are stronger together, and we are stronger than you. I just want to uh, also address one more thing to Mr. Brooks. These are um, two quotes that have gotten me through this entire process. You can mark it down in your Bible if you want for this one. It's Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The second one, also to go with his grandmother's statement. I picked it up from the book and movie The Shack, written by William P. Young. The quote is, Forgiveness in no way requires that you trust the one you forgive. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. It is about letting go of another person's throat. And I do want to acknowledge that I am letting go of your throat, Mr. Brooks, but I have not forgiven you. Thank you, for your, thank you, Your Honor, for the chance to speak today. Thank you to both of you. Hello, my name is Sasha Catalan. I was 17 years old when the Waukesha parade incident occurred. I was in my last year of high school thinking it was going to be the best senior year ever. Although I pushed through and made it to the end, it definitely was not easy for me or for any of us of that. After that one night that changed our lives. I was in the Waukesha South marching band as a clarinet player. How am I doing now? That's really hard to answer because some days I get scared to leave my house, especially now since the holidays are coming around. Even when it's the simplest holidays, my mind always finds a way to go back to that parade incident. Since that day, I don't really know how to act on many events, whether good or bad. What I mean by this is that I don't really know how to show my emotions as much anymore. Before, I used to open up and could easily be read as a book, but now even my mom wonders what goes through my head, and honestly, I wish she knew. But I know that if I were to tell her, she'd be worried for me, which is the last thing that I want. Sometimes I think of what-if situations since that day, that if I were to take the place, of one of those people who have passed, if it would have happened better. Although I am grateful to have received a chance to continue and to make something out of my life for the better, I get haunted by these thoughts. I used to never think this way, which scares me the most. Not sure whether to live actively and freely, like as if nothing ever happened, or to watch my back on the slightest things. At school, I sort of didn't want to receive any help for those from those who offered, 
not even my boyfriend, which hurt the most. Everyone hated me saying, hated me saying struggle to pick up and carry my books and binders, even carrying my backpack just over a shoulder. I wanted to continue as, norm as normally as I could back at school, but that was never gonna happen. I've never felt so weak like that before in my life. I felt empty and I cried. It was hard to carry those books and everything. So I gave in and let those, including my boyfriend, help me out. Even the basics are hard to do, such as write. Either my hand shakes a little or I would have, or I would have to use a clipboard for support. Even now, then, my shoulder would pop along with my elbow if I were to simply stretch. I had to relearn how to play my favorite sports, especially soccer, when it came to kicking the ball, since I was injured on my right side of the body. I tried to learn to be a lefty, but it was hard. So I decided to heal and to not give up even with the pain of kicking with my right. To this day, it's hard to sleep because sometimes I do dream of that incident. I wake up sweating from my head with a slight fever. I instantly wake up and try to calm myself down as my heart starts to race. I have to hug something instantly to feel that I am not alone and that I am safe, such as stuffed animal, sweater, or blanket. My family has been even more worrisome and strict to me, even though I am an adult now. They instantly want to know everything I want to do. We have trust, but since the parade, my mom has been nonstop talking about me possibly getting into a car crash or her never finding me or something because I didn't aware wear her of a last minute plan to go eat or to simply go to a store. I understand I never want her to worry, but at the same time, she shouldn't have to be thinking of such situations. I wanna pursue what makes me happy and to not have limits on myself or to feel not as confident because my mom would say that I'm better off with this since I'm safer. My life has not been easy and I've accepted that it won't be as normal as before. All of this, I still struggle to this day. I just keep moving forward, but I don't know when the nightmares will go away, when I will be completely healed physically and emotionally, having those reenactments of seeing my friends in the band scatter or those on the floor. I just wish, I just wish that day never happened. Definitely not the adulthood I thought I would be having now, <coughs> considering I do not know what to go in for college. This is due to me having now an interest in the medical field or law school because of the prey tragedy and wanting to have justice served for everyone in this community. This is how I am to this day. Definitely not the same Sasha as I once was before. I may be stuck finding myself for a period of time, but I am trying my best to not let the incident that affects us, that affected us all to get the best of me and define who I am and to define who we all are. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I have a statement from Sasha's mother to read. And then I have three more statements from members of the Waukesha South Band in this group, Your Honor. <clears throat> and the next one after this is the first. Judge Doro, I want to express in this letter my feelings since the day of the accident, so to speak. My daughter at that time was a student at South High School and a member of the band in which some members, including her, were struck by the truck causing injuries. Since that day, I cannot get out of my head all of the screams of pain, anguish, and terror that were heard along that long street with no end in sight, young children, elderly people, and relatives running to protect themselves. I had mixed feelings, and even worse, my daughter was in the hospital with a lost look and without understanding what had happened. There have been months of uncertainty, of sleepless nights, nervous breakdowns, and foolish thoughts. What hurts me the most is seeing how my daughter has completely changed. From being a girl who wanted so many things for her future to see her now so quiet, so distant, and still so stunned with many questions 
and so many others. The hardest thing to hear is that she would have preferred to give her life for that of some other person who lost their life. For me as a mother, it is very difficult to be able to tell her that everything will be fine when at the time I was not behind her to protect her from everything that happened. I know that many will say overcome it already, but nobody knows what it's like trying to stand on your feet when your world has no floor. I hope justice is done and I am thankful to each and every one of you who has not left us alone policemen, doctors, prosecutors, angels, and all of those people who I could not name who were and are still here to support us. This is just the beginning for many of us and it will be a long road, but I am sure of one thing and that is that we will be able to get back up. Thank you very much. Waukesha, let's hug very tight because our children need us. Mother of victim I. <clears throat> and this next one, they sent us some photos this morning. <laughs> Are you ready? Thank you, Judge Doro, for your patience through this trial. Thank you to the entire prosecution team for being so well prepared for this case. And lastly, thank you to Victim Witness Assistance for looking out for all of us. My name is Donald Teagues, and I am the father of Victim Q, or Eric Teagues. Both of my sons, Eric and Tyson, were marching with the Waukesha South Marching Band in the 2021 Waukesha Christmas Parade. Eric was a junior and Tyson was a freshman. They were there to play Christmas music for the people and start off the holiday season. That came to a quick end when you, Darrell E. Brooks Jr., drove through the parade killing people, injuring people, and ruining what was supposed to be a beautiful event. And we haven't been told when to do the photos, so... Christy, if you can use your judgment, thank you. Darrell Brooks, you hit and ran over Eric along with some of his bandmates. Tyson, his younger brother, was just feet away from Eric when you hit and ran him over. Tyson witnessed his brother getting hit and ran over along with other bandmates. Tyson never left his brother's side during this incident. He even took off his jacket to help keep his brother warm while he laid in the middle of the street. He then had to call his mother and try to explain what had happened. As he stood next to his brother, he saw blood coming out of his ear, nose, and mouth, and his leg that was pointing backwards. He would just keep telling Eric he will be fine and that mom was on her way. He stayed with him until Eric was taken by ambulance to the hospital. Starting that night, Tyson had nightmares and had them for a week. He would wake up screaming and crying. And what made this even worse is he couldn't go to see his brother in the hospital and my wife and I could not be there for Tyson the first few nights because we were with his brother in the ICU at Children's Hospital. My daughter, who wasn't at the parade, but went with her mother to the parade after Tyson called. She stayed with Tyson at the scene and at home when, she couldn't, when we couldn't be there. She needed to see a psychiatrist to help her deal with what she saw on the streets that day and seeing her brother lying there on the ground not knowing if he would live. She had to be in outpatient care for two weeks to help her through what she saw. Eric was an aspiring baseball player for the Waukesha South baseball team and a select baseball player for Sticks Academy. He was making his final push to get better and wanting to be scouted by colleges to play in college at an elite level. You took that away from him that November day. He spent nine days in the hospital. Three of those were in ICU. Eric suffered from a skull fracture a major concussion, a C4 fracture, right shoulder fracture, four broken ribs, a partially collapsed lung, T6 through T11 fractures, and a left femur fracture that required surgery. He is lucky to be alive. The C4 fracture could have killed him, the femur fracture could have killed him, or the broken ribs along with the lung collapse could have killed him. His time in the hospital was very hard dealing with nonstop pain from you hitting him and running over him like he was a speed bump. He had to lay flat for four days and wear a C collar for seven days because of the C4 fracture. He had a chest tube to drain the blood off of his lung for, so he could breathe. He had to undergo surgery to repair his severely fractured femur. On top of all that, he was dealing with a severe concussion. He could not have any lights on or loud noises. He would have events of uncontrolled vomiting and would spike fevers. When he was finally able to leave the hospital, it was in a wheelchair and he was in that wheelchair for over a month. 
We had to have a wheelchair ramp built for when we came home. Without the ramp, it would have been very hard to get him in and out of the house. My wife had to take off a month of unpaid leave from work. I had to take off three months from work to take care of him and get him to multiple doctor appointments a week. Darrell Brooks, you stated during this whole trial that you were a man, a God-loving man. You are not. A real man would have stopped when they saw they made a mistake. A real man would have admitted the wrong and would not have put all these families through this pain. A man of God would have stopped, admitted to his wrongs, and asked for forgiveness. You sat there showing no emotions for what you did and pretend that reading the Bible was going to help you. But you, Darrell Brooks, are pure evil that is not fooling anyone. You don't know God, but you better start learning because where you, were, where you are going, you're going to need to start praying a lot. You don't deserve to see the light of day ever again. You should never be able to see your children again. It's too bad this state doesn't have the death penalty because you would be put to the front of the line. I hope you rot in hell, have a miserable existence in prison, and that someone teaches you a true lesson in asking for forgiveness. Amen. The next statement is from victim H. It's been nearly a year since the Waukesha parade incident, and I know my friends, family, and myself still remember it vividly. Personally, I have an injury that could affect me the rest of my life. Doing normal things like carrying groceries or even my school supplies to classes have proven to be more of a challenge compared to what it used to be. And some mornings I'm not even able to lift my arm past my shoulder. It's hard, but I'm living through it because I refused a long time ago that I would have this man, someone who thought of no one and nothing past the incident, control what I can and can't do. I can't remember vividly what happened, just pain sparking up from the back of my head and my shoulder and people standing over me. It wasn't until I woke up the next day after everything and tried to stand up did I realize how much pain I was truly in and it only got worse the following days. My progress in what I can do with my injuries over this difficult year has been positive. I've rebuilt most of my strength, but I've been told time and again from my family, friends, medical professionals, it may never be what it used to be and to remember that this may be it. But that's only a possibility to me. Nothing is set in stone. Medicine is a practice because we never have all the answers. I was lucky to have family and friends who could help me physically, but nothing was permanent. All it took was a single thing to throw all progress out the window. If I wake up lying on my side, I already know that that day is going to be painful because simple things like sleeping hurt. Emotionally, the only constant support I've had is that of my friends and family. I've chosen out of my own free will not to see medical pro professionals for my mental state because I hold the belief that therapy is great and can do many great things for people. But what I do here and now has a bigger impact on myself. Putting a pause on my life to think about what happened to me and the people I know isn't worth it. I wake up at least twice a week to terrors of what happened, seeing and feeling the same things as that night and the days that followed. The endless possibilities of what could have happened, not just to me but others, whether I knew them or not, flood my dreams and scare me to my core. I remember my parents the day after. I had been dead asleep all night from stress and finally running out of adrenaline to find out that they hadn't slept. My father chose to stay up in the living room where I had been sleeping to watch over me instead of recuperating himself. I may not have completely understood then because I didn't want to, but after a year of dealing with the outcome, I understand. Being who I am, I hide what I'm feeling a lot. Right after the incident, I remember friends coming up to me and seeking comfort to which I had no problem with, but there would be triggers in what they would say that would bring me back. But I pushed it away to comfort others. Humor is the world's medicine, and like most traumatic situations in my life, I've apl applied humor to this now. I'm sensitive to who I'm with, but when talking, I try to think of something witty or humorous so that I can jump over the obstacle or burden of trauma, and to put it plainly, sadness. <clears throat> This past homecoming, my friends and I had gone to the dance and one of my friends was driving us to eat afterwards. The place was on the far side of town and the quickest route was through downtown. It wasn't their fault at all, but we were stopped because a group of people were crossing the road and it was right near where I was hit and I panicked. My vision went blurry and I had flashbacks of the night. My friends had noticed and helped me through it and we found a better route. I can't remember a time before having that bad of a panic attack where it's hard to breathe and knowing the reason behind it is just another reminder I won't be the same, much like most people who were affected. 
During the time of the trial, I've stayed away from news on what's happening. I've overheard conversations with family members. Sometimes it's brought up within my friend groups, most of which have chosen to be understanding of my choices and move away from the topic. Mentally, this past month, I've had more terrors, not always while I'm sleeping, but when I zone out at school or at home. I never show a reaction because I choose to keep that in, but I do change in how I stand or sit, and I noticed I'm more jumpy around people after experiencing these terrors. Hearing about what happened within this case has been a stressful time for everyone in my family. I tend to not sleep as well as I normally do, even on good nights, and I find myself panicking over small things such as schoolwork more than I ever have. Thank you, victim H. <laughs> and the final statement from the band is from victim K. At the time of the Waukesha holiday parade, I was your typical carefree teenager. As a 17 year old at Waukesha South, I had only just begun my senior year, a time that some might argue to be the best year of high school. Sadly, that all changed in a mere instant. I was marching in the parade with the Waukesha South Band, playing the sousaphone, parentheses tuba, when Brooks appeared out of nowhere, plowing into me from behind. He dragged both me and my instrument upon the hood of his vehicle for what seemed like miles, before eventually running me over entirely. Luckily, I was swiftly rushed to Waukesha Memorial Hospital by an officer via squad car for emergency treatment. I was completely alone during this time and positively terrified. The ER medical staff was utterly shocked that I had even survived such a forceful impact. I suffered multiple injuries due to the impact, including ligament damages, deep tissue contusions, and both a sprained neck and ankle. Post-evaluation, the doctors explained to me how my instrument had likely saved my life. Saved my life. Those words still echo loudly in my head. While my instrument may have helped to protect me, my life as I knew it was entirely destroyed by Brooks that evening. I spent several weeks on crutches, then followed that up with multiple braces. I felt completely disabled as I was unable to walk or even move without constant pain or assistance from someone. Outside of the injuries I sustained, my entire body ached for several weeks and I felt like one giant bruise. This lengthy loss of mobility ultimately resulted in the loss of my only employment, my part-time job. However, despite my injuries, it was the sheer horror of the events of that night coupled with the unwanted attention after the parade, which sent me into a downward spiral of misery and depression. Everything I had experienced and continued to deal with had eventually caused me to lose all focus, so I fell behind at school. I simply gave up on my studies and school entirely after the accident. I hated all of the extra attention it brought. Consequently, I was not able to graduate on time with all of my closest friends and peers. That was one of my lowest times, which of course only added to the darkness and depression I was already trying to navigate through. Any physical injuries that my body sustained as the result of this crime do not begin to compare to the mental massacre I have been forced to battle every day since then. My dreams have been assaulted by the images of that night. Bodies were strewn everywhere. Victims were sobbing and crying in pain and fear all around me. My horrific dreams have all but forced me into a constant and chronic state of insomnia. I have been unable to enjoy any form of restful slumber in nearly a full year. I also cannot bring myself to revisit the downtown Waukesha area at all. I become completely stressed even being near the area where I was hit. This is disturbing on a very personal level. My mother is a Waukesha native born and raised. She would often reflect upon her love for this town, the events and parades, and the community as a whole. Our family used to spend so many days together in the downtown area, but not now. Now I become physically ill just considering going downtown, and it hurts to know we can no longer share those special family moments together. In addition, I now suffer from panic attacks in any crowded public settings. I cannot even enjoy a simple sporting event or concert because I have developed a hypersensitivity to screaming crowds. They send me into a complete panic, putting my head on a swivel, and always watching for danger. The PTSD and hopelessness that I continue to suffer as a result of that November day continues to be an ongoing battle, warranting decades of therapy. Mr. Brook is sheer evil in its vilest form. He should never again know any sense of freedom. I hope that the rest of his days are haunted by the videos, images, and stories shared by each and every victim. 
I hope every night his dreams are teeming with visions of those six innocent people who perished in his wake. I want him to suffer like all of us has every single day until he takes his very last breath. His refusal to accept any responsibility for his actions deserves no less. I would strongly urge the court to extend the firmest sentencing possible for every single guilty charge on behalf of myself, my family, all of the victims, the dearly deceased, and all of Waukesha. Please issue Brooks the maximum penalties possible. Victim K. That is the end of this group. <clears throat> All right, thank you. I know we had about an hour or so break, but it, I do think it's also important that court staff and everyone here get a lunch break as well. So we will break for an hour-ish. Uh, I'll plan to be back here at 1.15. All right, thank you everyone. We are in recess. Well, there you have it. Yeah. That stuff's brutal. That's, I mean, yeah. Uh, it is brutal. Like, we, we deal with personal injury cases. I mean, mine, you know, occasionally were like workplace issues and med mal, which is a little bit different. But you see these things and you kind of get a little bit desensitized. But in this sort of a context, it really does hit you differently. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I it's advice on the defense side. Well, even. <clears throat> Even, you know, I, and I'm sure you deal with death cases and uh, paralysis and everything else, but there is a, there is a distinct difference in that. I mean, I can't think of a case in, you know, over 25 years of practice where somebody meant to do it. It's negligence. It's not intent. Right. Right. That, that makes a big difference. It doesn't, it doesn't change the injury, but uh, the, the, the notion that somebody intended to do that. No, it's, it's horrific. It's, it's terrible. It really is. It's, it's God awful. I, I, yeah, I don't even know what to do with that. Yeah, that's, that's wild stuff. All right. So we got our signals crossed that, that, that no, was good. not, uh, uh, just for everybody else. I saw it in the chat. It's like, no, John and I are not at war here. Uh, we, we both just saw it and just turned it on. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't see, I didn't see your link to the restarted stream. So I just was like, shoot, I got to start something. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense because we're covering it, you know, and we're, we're both anticipating the one o'clock. So unfortunately I still have that deposition. I, I'm going to go do that. So go, go, uh, go put your screen stream together. Everybody go over to Jay Rabine. Yeah. Uh, mine's running. Um, I'm going to try to run over there. If, if I, I can. put it in the private chat, can you have the mods drop it here? Just so people know where to go that are here right now. Yeah. Uh, that's the, that's the YouTube link for the one. Yeah, it's I'll put you know. here. Yep. All set to go. Let me see here. I just don't know how to do this, but I'll do this. Wait, then you go back here. I just don't think, I think only mods can post links in your chat. Well, aren't I a mod? You, yeah, there you go. You got it. I mean, like the, I, that's, that's a serious question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <apparently> not. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's where that's where I'll be in about an hour for us to continue. Um, I think we're, we might actually we might still get done today. I'm mildly confident or mildly optimistic. Well, apparently he's got a bunch of people though, so I don't if he really does. Uh, although I think he's probably optimistic at the number of people that are going to show up and say something. We know Grandma is. Well, she issued a statement. Yeah, that's true. But we also know a huge chunk of them are going to be Zoom. So how many of them are going to just not show up? Yeah. It's not like they're physically in the courtroom. So Well, uh, if not, then I, I think it'll just make, it'll just turn tomorrow into a little bit longer day. Yeah. But I, I can't mean, imagine it goes beyond tomorrow. No, there's no way it goes beyond tomorrow. I mean... Let's say even if they have, even if he has nine witnesses, there's no way the judge will even let them go on for long enough to take up the day. And she'll she'll make up her decision tonight. She doesn't care what any of these people have to say. Well, I, yeah, and her decision's I, already made. Let's be honest. In any circumstance, sure. <laughs> so. yeah, I, I don't even know if she has a decision to make. I, I think statutorily, she's she's probably pinned in to, to such a short range. It doesn't really matter. No, that's true. I, I mean. 
I think the whole point of this is it really is catharsis for the victims. And yeah. he's entitled to his side too. That's kind of a technicality. I don't think anyone cares what they have to say. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, I think it really is, uh, you know, this is therapy through law in, in a very serious sense, yeah. but I think it's, it probably is really good for that community to, to have a good portion of them stand up and give their, their side of events after they, after they've had to sit there and bite their tongues for yeah, a year. Shenanigans and, ugh. I, th- I think that, that one, that one, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, the word I'm, I, I was going to call him a kid. The guy I with the mullet. I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but the the one, and he gave, gave a great statement. Absolutely. Um, he, he really voiced a lot of that frustration with the trial. In, in the nicest way possible, while thanking the judge. It was yeah. very well done. No, I, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I thought there was a nice mix. There was a, there was a lot of this. There's a lot of this sort of sweet Christian sentiment, yeah, which I agree with, and I don't have any problem with, and I think that's a lot of very high road. But but one of them said, um, "You don't know God, but but you better learn about it fast yeah. and yep. burn in hell." And I thought, you know, <laughs> you know, someone needed to go fire and brimstone in the group. I agree, and you know I, what? I'm glad like, someone did more of that. It's the largest I, I the you're talking about the kids. Yeah, but but somebody you're entitled to have one crank at least. You, you know, they, they, he more he more than deserves it. Oh, absolutely. And I even like you know talking about that kid with the mullet. Incredibly eloquent, incredibly well put together. And I think going through this process helped him in his own mind kind of sort out his feelings. You know, his thanks toward you know the, the witness impact uh, group. They seem to have a great support network for witness, for uh, victims. And I'm sure hundreds of other people were, were impacted. Yeah, yeah, thousands of other people. But but I think enough enough happened that all those viewpoints got represented. And, that, and that's a really good thing. Yeah. And at the same time, not everybody's necessarily going to want to come forward and speak. And, yeah. But I, I think every single one of them I was very impressed by. So, yeah. You know, I think we have the dancing grannies coming up, and I don't know who the fourth group's going to be. Okay. But if you notice, they did uh, the baseball team, the bands, dancing grannies is going to be one, and then I don't know who the fourth is going to be. <sighs> that seems to be the way that they've organized this. All right. Well, everybody go over o- over to John's channel. I If if my deposition, I, I was telling him in, in our private chat, I think this my, my particular deposition – is going to go on for a while, so I, I don't know. But I think this will go on for a while, too, so I'll, I'll probably get a chance to, to stop over there as well. Yeah, we were talking about it. I think, I think it'll go a little bit late because of the delay, but, you know, that's okay. Yeah. All right, all right, Cole. Thanks, everybody, for coming back with no notice. See and, all uh, I'll see you all soon. Peace.